as we jump into this next section of Matthew, the last couple weeks have been a kind of difficult sermons. Uh, this one's not going to be any different. This is going to be all so uh, difficult. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the need for us to help each other call out sin in each other's lives. Uh, last week, we looked specifically at church discipline. What does that look like in the context of a church when a church family gets together so we're able to call each other out and, uh, and, and confront each other in love and be able to see change uh, in each other's lives and, and the role of the church in that? And uh, though the, uh, the uh, setting is changing a little bit, we're going to see Jesus moving on to another crowd, but yet there's a clear continuation of thought here as he now is going to be talking about divorce. Uh, we, uh, I, I did a sermon about a year ago in July uh, on divorce. It was on uh, lust, divorce, and remarriage. And it was kind of more of a theological foundation and looking at the kind of the real ins and outs. So if you're interested in kind of more details, because I'm not going to answer all those questions today uh, because we covered it a year ago and I put that sermon in the notes there for you. So if there's a lot of unanswered questions, and, and there will be, there usually always is in any sermon, uh, but, uh, but if there's some unanswered questions uh, on some of the particulars, uh, go at least check out that other sermon that I have in the notes in the, on, the other, on the right side of the page. Because um, we're going to look at a very specific aspect uh, this morning of this, this topic of divorce. Uh, and so I, I'm not going to cover everything, but I'm going to really kind of hone in on something that Jesus says here. Uh, and, and I just want to make this clear too, for those of you who are single, uh, don't check out this morning. Uh, because what we're going to be going at in particular is so important, one, for either uh, preparation for before you get married or if you never do get married. Uh, it's, just, it's just important stuff for us just to have good, healthy relationships and friendships, period. Just to have a, even just to have a good relationship with the Lord, period. Uh, so don't check out uh, just when you see the word divorce or marriage going, oh, this one's not for me. This one's for you too, uh, absolutely for you. Uh, because what we're gonna be seeing this morning that it's really interesting where Jesus goes here. Uh, he's going to point out to us, because I don't know if you, if you ever saw this before, knew this before, but Jesus really only gives one reason, and I don't mean cause. You know, we, we've seen in the scriptures that uh, Jesus, Jesus says that the only um, uh, kind of a, a, a admissible reason for divorce is adultery. But I'm not talking about the, the, the reason, but there's only one cause for all divorces, because a lot of divorces, they end because of either adultery or because of just disinterest or our personalities aren't the same or we fell out of love with each other or financial things or there's just a number of reasons, both biblical and unbiblical, lots of reasons why people get divorced. And I, I'm not going to go through stats this morning, but I'm going to guess that every single one of you has been affected by divorce somehow, whether it's you yourself or your parents or a really close friend. Okay, it's, it's, it's all over the place and has caused tremendous hurt and pain uh, in probably all of our lives in some form or fashion. So I'm not going to go over the stats or anything like that, but what's so interesting is as we look at this, and this is why it's so important, you, you've been affected by divorce, each and every one of you. And it's so important to see that Jesus is going to show us that there's actually only one real cause for divorce, and it's not a disinterest thing, it's not a personality thing, it's not an adultery thing, it's not a pornography thing, it's not a money thing, it's none of those things but it's something that each and every one of us actually deals with and battles each and every day, and that's hardness of heart. He says the reason divorce exists is because we harden our hearts. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean the husband is hardened his heart against the wife or the wife against the husband, but just when your heart gets hardened about anything in life, your job or money or whatever, uh, n very rarely actually does a certain sin just stay compartmentalized over in this part of your life. Right? If it's money, it doesn't just affect your finances. You get hard-hearted and bitter about a financial situation, then out of relief, you go start looking at pornography, and now all of a sudden it's affecting your marriage. So, so I'm not talking about husbands being bitter or hard-hearted towards wives or wives hard-hearted towards husbands. I'm just talking about hard-heartedness, period. So if you ever find yourself even getting remotely hard-hearted about anything, it's a little bitter, a little angry, a little upset about anything in life, you are a candidate, I'm just going to be totally honest, you're a candidate for divorce. Because no one ever just wakes up and says, I want to get a divorce. It is a, it is a path that we eventually find ourselves on. 
And so we need to kind of just wake up a little bit today and just sober up a little bit and say, okay, if I have hard-heartedness in my life, I got to know that there's really no chance of that thing staying compartmentalized. That if I don't let that thing get uprooted, if that goes unchecked, it could affect so many other parts of my life, including my marriage. And so we want to look at this this morning very in depth, focusing in on this particular phrase that Jesus says to the people, uh, because this is so important for us to, to recognize uh, as the actual cause of not just a breaking up of a marriage relationship, but that's why I say for you those that are single, uh, and even those who are married, even in your friendships and your job, everything, what breaks relationships is hardness of heart. Uh, so let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to, to lead us in this today. And, and I, we prayed specifically, we had an awesome, awesome time of prayer this morning uh, behind here. Again, I'll invite you guys to come out at nine o'clock. Uh, we just had a great time of prayer today uh, with uh, the, the, the people that come out to pray and the worship team, um, just praying specifically that the Lord would uh, reveal uh, some of these parts in our hearts, uh, that we'd have some time of prayer at the end for you to receive prayer uh, because we wanna see, we wanna see our eyes open and, and see healing brought to our lives. Uh, healing brought to the, the hardness of our hearts, softening uh, so that we can really be free, free the way that God wants us to be. So Father, we, um, we come to you and even just the, the songs that we sang, we, we come to you, uh, naked we come to you, that you would dress us, dress us in your righteousness, dress us in the joy of your salvation. Dress us in the peace that surpasses understanding. Dress us in the peace that, that surpasses our situation and circumstances in our marriages or our friendships or our jobs. Dress us in your grace today. Dress us in your forgiveness today. Dress us in the blood of your son Jesus today. Dress us in acceptance that we've been accepted by you because of Jesus. So we come to you, we do come to you naked. We have nothing in our hand. Simply to the cross do we cling. That is all we have. We have nothing else. So we come acknowledging our, our brokenness, our fears, our anxieties, our failures, our sin, and we don't ignore them, but we bring them to the cross. We bring them to the cross and we, we see them as nailed to the cross. Help us to believe this this morning, that we would walk in freedom, that we would have our eyes open to the failures of our hearts and that we would confess those things and repent of those things, but that then we would walk in freedom from those things. Help us, Lord, open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, our minds, and teach us and show us. Convict us and encourage us. Thank you, Lord. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's open up to Matthew chapter 19. Uh, we're going to be going through uh, 12 verses today, 1 through 12. So it says here, this is what Matthew's telling us, that when Jesus finished these sayings, the sayings about church discipline, the sayings about cutting off the right hand if it causes us to sin or plucking out the eye, when he finished those sayings, so we're shifting gears a little bit, though we're going to see some clear continuation in thought, the way that Matthew's ordering his, uh, his book here, uh, but we're, we are changing the scenery. When Jesus finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. So he's continuing his, his ministry that he's been called to do. And the Pharisees came up to him, you know, the religious leaders, and tested him, always trying to catch him, always trying to figure out a way to trip him up. They tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Now, I'm not going to go into the details of this. It is in the other sermon, but this was a common question uh, in this day because there was two Jewish schools of thought for what was permissible in divorce. You can go to that other sermon for that, but, but they're trying to figure out of which camp, Jesus, are you in when it comes to Judaism? 
They're trying to pigeonhole him somehow and basically have him stake a claim in one camp or the other camp. So uh, one camp believed that it was lawful to divorce your wife over anything. She, you know, uh, you know cooked the hot pockets a little too long. Uh, you can divorce her. Uh, I mean, anything, you were just able to give her a certificate of divorce because that's just how that camp thought. And so here Jesus answers and doesn't, Jesus isn't going to land in one human camp. He's just going to land in the eternal truth that he is. And so here's his answer. He says, haven't you read that he who created them, husband and wife, from the beginning made them male and female? (laughs) So this isn't, uh, the, the answer isn't found in human thought here. The answer is found in God's created order and what God has done. And and this one who created the male and female said, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He's like, don't you you know that's that's the truth? It's not this camp or the other camp. This is the truth. That is God who actually unites people and makes them one. So, he says, they're no longer two, but they are one flesh. Flesh. So what therefore God has joined together, not man. Man does not join people together. God joins people together. Let not man separate those two. So it's God who makes people one. It's not man. This is why when I marry people, when I officiate a ceremony, I say at the end, by the power vested in me. It's not by my power. I have no authority. I'm not making people, I'm not marrying people. I don't actually make the marriage legitimate. I I have nothing to do with making a marriage legitimate. I'm just, I'm a public officiant. I publicly officiate what God is already doing. God is the one who joins two people together. So I say by the power that's given to me, I'm, I'm representing what God is already doing, but I have no ability to actually marry two people and make them one flesh. Only God can do that. It's similar to last week when we were looking at church discipline and and when he says uh, that that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven, that we are, when I say we, I mean the church, we are God's representatives on the earth. We are carrying out God's will, his will that is in heaven. We're carrying out his will here. So I'm only authorized to do what God is already doing. So I publicly officiate what God is doing. So for instance, just as a for instance, uh, if I was to officiate a homosexual wedding, that would not be an actual marriage because God has not ordained that. I can publicly officiate it all day long and that doesn't make them married. It doesn't make them one because only God can actually do that. I can only bind what is bound in heaven and that is not bound in heaven. So I can sign a document, I can do all those things, there can, all that stuff can happen, but I have no power to actually marry a man and a man or a woman and a woman because God has not ordained that from the beginning. And so when, it look, when we look at even just uh, this picture that if God has joined people together, then we're gonna see that it's only God that can actually give the authorization to separate. All right, and that's what we're gonna look at a little bit today and what causes that separation. So verse seven They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? So so if they're they're still trying to catch him, well, if God joins him together, then why did Moses permit divorce? It's a good question. And he said to them, it's because of the hardness of heart. That's why Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it wasn't so. That that wasn't how it was designed to be. So so here's kind of maybe a weird example Uh, God never designs, you you never would have seen a jail or prison in the Garden of Eden, right? Like that wasn't part of like the original schematic and, you know, kind of layout. Uh, That was not ever in his original design in the Garden of Eden. But because of the hardness of our hearts and the fact that sin entered into the world, now it's actually necessary for us to build prisons and to have some kind of repercussion for crime. And it's good that we, as God's human representation, It's good that we actually do imprison people that are causing harm to others. But from the beginning, it was not so. And so in the same way, even though it was never God's original design to have divorce enter into union, but because of the hardness of our hearts and because sin enters into our lives, he has permitted divorce in really just this particular situation that we're going to look at. 
And, and so, so we see that God, it says in the Word, God, God hates divorce. And in one sense, God hates prisons. He hates seeing that his uh, image bearers are committing crimes against one another. But yet, because of the hardness of our heart, these things have been permitted. They've entered into uh, the, the, the common creation uh, because of the hardness of our heart. So he says to you, to us, and this is where he's going to get specific. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, okay, adultery, this is the only exception. If you marry another, you, you now commit adultery. So if you get divorced, and again, this, I go more into detail in the other sermon, so... Uh, but if you get divorced and it's not because of adultery and you go remarry someone else, now you've committed adultery. Why? Why? That doesn't make sense. Why is that? But we're divorced. How is that adultery? Because if God has put you together, you cannot separate. You see what I'm saying? So, so if, if you get divorced for a human reason and not a God-allowed reason, you get divorced maybe because we just don't get along anymore. You can go to the court and you can have your marriage totally obliterated before a court of law, but not before the eyes of God. Because he's the one who ordained and he's the one who made you one. And so that piece of paper that says you're legally divorced, you could be legally divorced, but in the eyes of God, you're still married because you divorced under your own premise. You didn't divorce in a way that, that says, okay, God, I know that it's right before you my husband and my wife committed adultery. I know that I am free. Without sin, I can divorce because the, the pain of adultery is, 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 is deep. This is why God allows this one purpose because this marriage covenant has been radically broken. And so if, if that has not happened, you're still actually married. So then if you divorce and you go and get remarried, now you've become one with someone else while you're still married in the eyes of God. And so, so this is, now this is not how we speak in our culture, isn't it? And this is not, this isn't normal talking here. This is a very difficult thing to even talk about. It's a difficult thing to even wrap our heads around. This, you look at that saying, you go, are you serious, Jesus? There's only one cause that is biblically allowable for two believers to get divorced? Really, this is, that is a, that is quite a heavy thought. In our culture, in our day and age, it's so, we're so quick, we're so easier. Even if we're not quick, we still will, even if it's a slow process, we think through it, we'll still base our reason and purpose on what we think or what we feel or our own human logic. And we won't base ourselves on what Jesus says. Now, so if we see what Jesus says, we go, man, this is, this is difficult. This is, that's, a, that's a tall order right there to be committed till death to us part, save for maybe if adultery happens, then there is the allowance, not necessity, but allowance for the offended party, the offended spouse to divorce if they don't believe they can move on past that. So that, that's, that's, that's heavy, that's very different than what we're used to. So here's the thing, I just wanna quickly appeal to those of you who maybe, uh, maybe you're currently divorced, you're thinking through what the future holds for you, or maybe you're contemplating divorce, uh, maybe you've been divorced and, and you look back and you realize now that you did not divorce biblically and, and you're single now and you're kind of thinking what your future looks like or maybe you divorced unbiblically and you're realizing that now you're kind of looking at that going I, I didn't know that or maybe you did know it but you hardened your heart towards it or whatever it is and maybe now you're remarried and now you're going what do I do here's the thing we're, we're not going to be able to go through all the varying uh, situations uh, so if, if something is perplexing you, confusing you, uh, you're frustrated with, uh, just come talk to me afterwards because uh, there's so many different situations in this room uh, and we're not, we won't be able to address all of them. So if there's something that sticks out to you where you have questions on it, just find me after service or email me, whatever it is. I'd love to be able to help you walk through this. Last time we had this sermon, there's a couple of uh, different folks in here that uh, had just perplexing questions, difficult decisions to make. Uh, and it was great to see us work through things. So I just want to invite you guys to do that because I'm not going to be able to address every situation this morning. Uh, but I don't want to just move on past that and just kind of throw that little grenade out for you and move on. Uh, I want to just give you guys the invitation to come speak with me or, or whatever uh, you'd like to do um, if you have more questions. But in verse 10... He says this hard saying, and the disciples said to him then, which is probably what you're thinking right now, if this is the case... <laughs> of a man and his wife, 
it's better just not to marry. That's the disciples, that's their thought. They're going, if it's that intense that we are joined together and that's the only way out because even in their culture in one of these schools of thought where you can divorce for any purpose, similar to today, they're going, wait a minute, there's only one cause? Okay, that is crazy. Maybe it's just better we don't get married. And look what Jesus says. He doesn't actually argue with them. He says, not everyone can receive this saying. This isn't for everybody. You guys, marriage is not for everyone. It, it really is not. It is a very tall calling. It is a very high calling. It is a very difficult calling. It is, it is a lowly calling because we're called to lay our lives down for our spouse. We're called to die for ourselves, and not everyone is willing to do that. So it's not for everybody. There are some people who uh, are called to be single for God's glory. Uh, singleness does not mean, it's not a second-class citizenship in the kingdom of heaven at all. Uh, there are many, many, many men of God throughout the ages and even in the scriptures were single men, single women that did the will of God and did it voraciously. Paul even says in his epistle, it's, it's the, the person who's single, they, they don't have their mind dis- divided between family priority and, and God priority. They just, they're single-minded. They're just going after the Lord. So it is not a second-class thing. This, is, this thing is not for everyone. When you really think about the intensity and seriousness of marriage, you go, this isn't for everybody. But when we have a very easy society where it's just easy just to give up and move on, you go, oh, it's for everyone. It's, it's my right to get married. It's not a right to get married. It's a privilege to get married. It might be God's call for you to get married. It might not be God's call to be married. It's a privilege to be single as well. So don't, don't think of it in this, this way because this isn't for everyone, Jesus says. There are eunuchs. These are people who don't get married. Either naturally they've decided not to get married or they will castrate themselves in some instances. But people who don't get married who have been birth, so just naturally and they've just done that their whole life. There's eunuchs who've been made eunuchs by other men, and there's eunuchs who've made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. There's some people who are single for the sake of the kingdom. They just say, this is, this is my calling in life. I'm going to remain single for the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who's able to receive this, receive this, this high call of marriage, and this, this lo- I should say this lowly call of marriage in order to lay yourself down, let that person who can actually die to self, let that person receive it. Okay, huge decision. Huge decision. Very serious this is why the common attitude for us of having sex before marriage and living together, all these things, uh, we, we do this. We don't take serious the, uh, the, the scope and the design of marriage. We, we play house with one another. Like it's this light thing. Like it's just kind of like, yeah, you know, maybe you give, give or take, you know, whatever. It's, it's just an add-on. You know, we're living together, having sex before marriage, and maybe we'll get married. It's just like an add-on just to kind of make it official so we can have the wedding, but no, 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 this is, this, is a, this is a thing that God designed from eons ago. This is a very serious thing. And so we're going to focus here on this, this cause of divorce, what brings this about. And it's not uh, because of falling out of love or finding someone else or, you know, we say all we do is fight or our personalities are different or the person I married is, is different than the person I'm married to today in the sense that they've changed so much and we become disgusted with our spouse. All these things, these are the reasons we cite for divorce. But in this broad sense, we're seeing that what Jesus says, it's because of the hardening of our hearts. This is why divorce has entered into reality for us. So we need to make this very clear that if you've ever experienced hardness of heart in your life, it's time for us to wake up. It's time for us to wake up and to acknowledge that we could be at some point in our life on the brink of divorce if we ever experience any kind of hardening of our hearts. And, and, and do not let yourself be the person sitting here today that says, that'll never be me. Our marriage is so great. We love each other. We're so in love. We get along with all of our all of our hobbies are the same. We have the same theology. We love the same baseball team, football team. We, we love all those things. This will never be me. Don't be that person today. Don't let it happen. I, I want to just, okay, seriously, I want you to take a second right now. And I just want you first, just almost like a just like a few seconds of silence here, just to even repent right now of that pride that says that's totally, I'm above that. We would never do that. Repent of that pride right now. 
do not think for a second that you're above this. I know you love your wife. I know you love your husband. I know you have all these like cute nicknames for each other. I know you have the same favorite TV shows. I know that. But do not think that those things are going to uh, make you non-susceptible to divorce at some point because Jesus says it's the hardness of heart. It's not the difference of hobbies. It's not the lack of nicknames. It's hardness of heart. So just, I mean, seriously, take the second. I want you to think to yourself right now, before we move on, I want you to say to yourself, I need to listen to this because this could be me someday. I need to pay attention to this because though I don't see myself going there, I know I can. All sinful actions, all sinful actions start with the hardening of the heart. All of them. So let's look at the progression of sin here. A lot of this stuff we're going to be going through, some of it I, we, uh, we went through in our instruments class. So some of this would be a little review for some of you guys, but uh, it's, just, it's just, it's gold. It's gold for us to see how sin progresses so we can stop it when it's starting. I read an intriguing article, um, I don't know when it was, maybe uh, six, eight months ago, it was on counseling, and, and, and this guy was talking about how the slippery slope that we, we talk about a lot, it's real, the slippery slope is real, we see it in scripture, we see it in our lives, but it's a really horrible argument in counseling. Not because it's not real, but because when you're on the slippery slope, you don't see it. So I cannot tell you how many times I've been in some kind of a counseling situation or a fight club situation, whatever, and I'll say, hey, bro, I just, and I see you this, with this relationship here. I know it's innocent, but I just, I kind of see that going, you know, you, you started doing this and, and you kind of talked to him this way and it's kind of, I don't know, I just, I don't think it's wise. Never does that conversation actually go well. Oh, no, 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 we're just, we're just friends, or no, 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 we have this, this, this. And I'm going, yeah, I, I know, but, you know, Proverbs says, uh, this is where we get the phrase, Proverbs says, how can a man carry uh, fire next to his chest without his clothes burning, without his clothes not burning? He's, so that's where we get the phrase, if you play with fire, you're going to get burned. Proverbs says that, you can't hold fire by your chest and not have your clothes burn. But, but when every, almost, almost every time, every once in a while, uh, someone goes, oh, thank you for telling me that. Uh, but most of the time, when you use that analogy, that argument, the slippery slope, it's never really received because it's just, it's just your opinion. And so what we need to do, it doesn't mean that it's not there. It doesn't mean it's not real. We're going to actually see specifically that the slippery slope does indeed exist, even biblically. But we need the word of God to show us. And so when I go to talk with people, I need, to, I need to be able to, if I can, I need to be able to show them specific biblical commands that they are even compromising. Uh, even though the slippery slope argument might be actually valid, but very difficult for people to see. So I need to be able to, and we need to be able to see specific things that we say, no, look, you did this with that person. Look what the word of God says specifically about that thing. The word of God needs to be going into our, our, our eyes, our ears, our hearts in order to allow the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin. Allow the Holy Spirit to actually convict us that yes, we're on the slippery slope because we will rarely hear it from other people. And today I'm hoping that we can set ourselves up to be people who do hear it from people. I don't want you to be the next person who says, oh, no, 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 You're, that's just your opinion. Uh, I wanna set us up to be people who actually listen to the people that are in our lives. Even if we think they're a little, ah, you're a little crazy, you're not seeing this right, we need to be able to listen. Okay, so let's look at Hebrews chapter three, verse 12. Hebrews chapter three, the author of Hebrews here says, take care, brothers. I want you to pay attention, brothers and sisters here. Lest there be in any of you an evil, some of your Bibles say sinful, unbelieving heart. So he's talking to brothers here, Christians. Take care, Christians. Let there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Christian, do you know that you can have a heart of unbelief even though you believe? Beware that you would have an evil or sinful, unbelieving heart that leads you to fall away from the living God, not unto hell and damnation. If you're a believer, we're not talking about falling away permanently, perpetually, eternally, but falling away from fellowship, falling away from communion with God. Your unbelieving heart will lead you away from fellowship with God. 
but instead exhort one another every single day as long as it's called today so that none of you can be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, the way the sin just tricks us and fools us. So we need to be around each other so we can speak into each other's lives so that when we go down the slippery slope, where we start off with, we're going to see the slope here. I'm going to walk us through each word here. We need to be around each other so we can see each other going down this very, I think it was C.S. Lewis that said that the, the, the slippery slope is gentle and, it, and, it's very, and it's soft underfoot. And it's so gradual. We don't even notice it because it's gentle underfoot. So let's look at each one of these words here real quick. If you have your Bible open to Hebrews 3, maybe you want to mark up each word. Uh, the word evil or sinful, some of your Bibles say, these are the subtle patterns of sin that we allow. Lest there be any, in any of you a sinful, uh, just sin sinfulness, things, patterns that you allow, thought processes, desires, those types of things. But then unbelieving, uh, now we're not believing certain truth. We're not just kind of entertaining this lie, but now we're not believing the truth. So now we're starting to make excuses for our sin. We're backing away from the clear word of God, the clear scriptures. We're not believing the word now, even subtly. We'll say things like, well, I just, I'd be happier with another spouse. They treat me better. They provide for me in ways that my spouse does not. I'm justified to go do this or that thing because they did this or that to me. We'll say things like, well, why? yeah, I know this is wrong, but this is different, right? We say that one a lot here, right? Well, this, this is different. I know that's wrong, but this is different because if you only knew the spouse that God gave me, put the blame on God, just like Adam and Eve, right? We say things like, I, but, but I deserve. Don't I deserve? Because the Bible says that my wife or my husband should treat me this way, and, and so I deserve that now. And so therefore, since I'm not getting that, I deserve it. I'm gonna go find it somewhere else. And maybe not with a person, but maybe in something else. Maybe in your career or a hobby or whatever it is. But, but you feel like you deserve a certain something. And so now you're unbelieving that Christ alone can give you that something. And so you go look elsewhere. And the next phrase, turning away. It leads us to fall away. It leads us to turn away. You've lost now your spiritual anchor. Now you're just on the sea. Every wind and wave has just thrown you about. You're just like a ship on the ocean, and there's no anchor. And you start realizing, or maybe you don't realize, but if you look back, by God's grace, and you get brought out of this fog, you look back and you see that you were a wayward vessel on the sea. Not just in your marriage, not just in relationships, but everywhere. You, just, you look back and you go, man, my whole life was a wreck. I didn't even see it at the time. This is what happens. We ignore the Lord and his promises. And then, fourthly, the hardened heart. Your heart now becomes numb and scabbed over do to sin. You're not even sensitive to the word of God. You're not even sensitive to the people in your life anymore. You just, you just kind of purse your lips and you just kind of, you know, kind of just grin and bear it. You just listen to the people speaking in your lives. You don't really want to hear them, but you're just putting up with it. And you just kind of just, mm. You start just hardening yourself. Now, the scary part of this is, is this, is that the heart, now you've got this numbed, calloused heart. The heart actually is what controls everything you do and say. It is like, the, it's like the, the nervous center of your soul. Your heart is what actually makes the decisions for you. It's the steering wheel. You know, your circumstances or maybe people, that might be fuel that gets added, kind of provokes certain things, provokes the idols and gods, false gods in your heart. But at the end of the day, your heart has the steering wheel. And so when you, when you put that other fuel in their circumstances or people, you've got the decision now to guide your decision making. When bad things come, you don't have to steer towards sin. You can steer towards the Lord. You can have the gas keep putting in, bad circumstances, people picking on you, all these things, but you can steer towards the Lord. Your heart is the thing that actually steers you. So the scary part of this is that when we become deceived and unbelieving and turning away, now our heart's hard, our hearts are numb, and we start steering towards sin because our heart is actually what controls our decisions. It's not a person. No one controls you. No one forces you to make any decisions. No circumstance controls you. Okay, we are hearts 
That's, that's how we make decisions. It's what we, what we value, what we want, what we desire. And we're gonna see this constantly in the word. We're gonna see it this morning. So when our hearts are filled with sinful desires or feelings or we're focused on ourselves, uh, we're gonna harden ourselves and steer away from God and, and godliness and steer towards the desires of our heart. We're gonna go after those desires and we're gonna do whatever it takes to get those desires. So if we want real lasting change, we want real actual lasting change, this has got to take place through the pathway of the heart. If you have a deep sinful desire in your heart and you have a bad circumstance, when that circumstance gets fixed, usually that's when we're like, yay, we're, we're good. We get what we want and we move on. Well, guess what? That sin is still festering down below and it'll wait just for another opportunity to jump out. So fixed circumstances or fixed relationships don't fix the problem. They just, they don't. They put off the problem to another day. Or they provide opportunity for that problem to grow even bigger because all of a sudden you've put a topical numbing solution on the skin, but you haven't dealt with the cancer. So now you just ignore it and you move on and you think all is well in the world because I don't have any pain anymore. No, you're dying on the inside. You're dying on the inside. And so the only way to have real lasting change and have real freedom in our lives is the pathway to the heart. It is never just to get what we want. That never solves anything. Never solves anything. So we need change of heart. So a couple things to consider here. And we'll jump into James 4 because I love what James 4 shows us here. But a couple things to consider. Your heart is, my heart is always being ruled by someone or something. I'm, I'm giving that someone or something the opportunity to rule my heart. I've abdicated my responsibility and I'm letting a circumstance actually direct my decisions or a person direct my decisions rather than me saying, no. No, I'm gonna repent of that deep desire and I'm gonna run towards the Lord. So we have to ask ourselves and ask yourself this question even now, what is effectively and functionally ruling your heart today? And we know theologically, the big picture is we know that the Lord is sovereign over all things. But we're talking about existentially, functionally, in a very real and tangible, effective way. What is ruling your heart today? Is it a person? Is it a circumstance? Because it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. And it shouldn't be. The deepest issues of our human struggle the deepest issues of our marriages, of our friendships, aren't issues of pain and suffering and rights and all these things. They're issues of worship. What do you worship? Who do you worship? Your solution is found in only in God, only in Christ. But when we find ourselves with these sinful desires, all of a sudden we are worshiping ourselves, worshiping our desires, worshiping our rights or what we think are rights. So look what James 4 says. Open up, if you could, to James 4, uh, verse 1. This is so amazing because James is going to tell us that what causes conflict in our relationships is the war that's going on inside of us. There's a war, there's a battle going on between the spirit and the flesh inside of us. So James 4, verse 1, he says, what causes quarrels, okay? Friends, couples, you ever get in arguments, you ever feel just your, your stubbornness well up, your pride well up, you get defensive when you get in a discussion or argument with your spouse or a friend, does that ever happen to you? Yes, the answer is, right? Okay, why? Why do you fight? Why do you quarrel with even the people that you love dearly? Why do we do this? Look what James says. What causes these quarrels and what causes fights among you? I mean, th we, would, we would do so well if we actually would read this and believe this because we fight a lot, don't we? Even with people we love. Is it not this, James says? I'm gonna tell you exactly why we fight and why we argue. It's that your passions are at war within you. There is something in your heart that you want deeply. And in this moment, your spouse is not giving it to you or your friend is not giving it to you. You feel like you rightly deserve this thing. 
And so you've got this passion deep inside you that is at war. You've got a passion. You have a passion for God. You've got a passion for the gospel. But that passion is at war with this passion that you want just some validity or value or attention or you want to be propped up or you want to be loved or, or cared for by another human being. And so these two passions are in opposition with each other and there is war. And what, what is the whole point of war? What is the end goal of war? Why do countries go to war? It's all about control. Right? War is about control. Your sin wants to have control over your life. And the gospel of Jesus Christ wants to have control over your life. So there is a war going inside of our hearts for control. And, and, and we have the steering wheel. And we've got the word of God that is the light to our path, but yet because we harden ourselves and we buy the lie and we harden ourselves and have these unbelieving hearts towards the promise, then we start steering towards this other desire over here. And so James says, this is why we fight. This is why we argue that we have passions that are at war within you. You desire and you don't have. So what do you do? You murder and put, put the sin in there. You desire, you don't have. You commit adultery, you desire, you don't have. You gossip, you desire, you don't have. You have selfishness, you desire, and you don't have. So you steal. Put whatever sin that you battle right there, you desire, and you don't have. So therefore, that's why you do that sin. No one forced you to do it. Your circumstance didn't force you to do it. It's the desire that is in your heart. This is what drives you. And it's at war within us. You covet and you can't obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You want something else. You don't have because you don't ask. You don't ask the Lord for it. God, I just want value. I just want, I just want acceptance. The Lord's like, ask me. I'll give you more value and more acceptance than you could possibly ever know what to do with. God, I just want to be loved by someone. Ask me. I have more love than what every human in existence could possibly give to you combined. You have not because you don't ask. And then when you do ask, you don't receive that love because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So when we finally do ask for love, we ask for the wrong love. We go, God, I just want the love of people. I just want the praise of man. I just want the money. I just want this. And then he doesn't give it to us because we're asking wrongly. We just want to spend those gifts on our own passions. I'm going to look in our notes here because this is just, I, want to, I just want you guys to see this progression because if, if we see this progression, we can now, we can know where these passions are coming from. We can locate their, uh, where, where they're at, their, their coordinates, and we can just start dropping gospel bombs on their location. We see the smoke coming up from the woods, and we see, okay, that's where the enemy camp is. Let's start attacking there. We got to see where these passions are coming from. We got to get to the root of the matter, the desire that's in our hearts. We can't just fix circumstances and relationships and think that everything's going to be great. We gotta get to the heart of this. So I just wanna show you this path so we can start recognizing these things. So this is how desire takes control. First, we have a desire. I want, I want something. I want love. I want peace. I want joy. I want, okay, nothing wrong with that. All right, you have single people. You have a desire to get married. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, you have a desire to have a better job. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with just having a desire. There's nothing wrong with that. But what happens is this, number two, then that want becomes a demand. I must have that. I must be married. I must meet someone. I must have the love or the respect of a spouse. I must have a better job. I must have more money. I must. Okay, the desire is no longer an expression of love for God and man, but something now I crave for myself. I must have this. Number three is a need. Now you start saying, I will have it. I'm not content with just knowing that I must. I'm, I will have this. I'm setting my heart on this thing. I'm gonna get it. Something desirable is now seen as essential. It wasn't, it wasn't just a desire anymore. Now it's, now it's essential for life and what you see is life and happiness and joy. I will have it. I'm convinced that I cannot live without it or I cannot live happily without it. I cannot live a full life without it. 
You're convinced that you will get something. Number four is an expectation. Now we start looking. This is when sin starts affecting other people. Now you look around and you have an expectation. You should. You should now provide me for the thing that I will have. Husbands, wives. Think through this. Think, think through this. What are those things when you've gotten in arguments and whatever, you've expected your spouse to give you something that you have determined that you will have? Your sinful desire, or actually, let me just back up. Let's just say your, your benign desire, okay, turned into a demand, then a need, and now you expect that you're gonna get that from your spouse. You should. This is where my relationships begin to get affected. If I believe I have a need, I expect others to make it happen if they really love me. And now we start manipulating. Well, I thought you loved me. I thought you said this. I thought you said that. It's, this, is, this is where... Oh. Number five, disappointment. When that person does not live up to what we expect either on purpose or because they just simply aren't built for it. Disappointment comes in and all of a sudden it's, you didn't, you didn't give me what I deserve. You didn't give me what I expected. Here the anger breaks out and becomes personal. Now we're actually taking it personal that this person deserves or they, they need to give me something I deserve and when they don't, then all of a sudden it's personal. You didn't do this. You're, you're standing in the way of what rules my heart. Now this person who has failed you is not giving you what you think you deserve and now they're standing in between you and your idol. Now you see them as someone who is not providing for you in the way that you think they should. So then six, what do we do? We punish. Well, because you didn't do this thing for me that I expect because I need, then therefore I'm gonna do this. And so this is when we fight. We have maybe silent treatment for some of you. Hurtful words. You know, we maybe go look at pornography or we commit adultery or we get some kind of vengeance or we belittle them with our words or, or we try to uh, heap, um, you know, uh, just all kinds of um, passive aggressive statements or legalism upon people or try to make them perform and let them, remind them constantly of how they've failed us. We, we, may, we punish people when they do not give us what we expect. And, we've, and we're very creative. We're very good at this, guys. I mean, our, our, I mean I, I'm just confessing. I'm, I'm, just, I'm good at this. I've gotten good at it over the years. We find ways to punish. And the, the, and the ways are just innumerable. In our marriages, we start looking for ultimate satisfaction in a person, and that's just impossible. It is foolish to think that another sinful human being can ultimately satisfy you. That's just, that's foolishness. A broken, sinful human being you really think is gonna bring you some ultimate satisfaction, it's not gonna happen. They are not God, and you're not God. You cannot be your spouse's savior either. This is, goes for friendships, this goes for everything. Listen to Proverbs. Proverbs 7. I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but it's just amazing. But this just shows the allurement of how the desires in our hearts, specifically when we look at adultery here because of the context of Matthew 19 here. But, but just but the, the wisdom that comes out of this that speaks directly to this battle that James is talking about, that Hebrews is talking about. Proverbs 7 verse 1 says, my son, keep my words. See, keep the promises of God, the gospel truth, and treasure up my commandments with you. This is what prevents us from hardening our hearts. When we keep God's words and commandments stored within us, keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Keep the promises of God, the gospel, at the forefront of your mind. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, we're personifying wisdom here. Say to wisdom, wisdom, you're my sister. I know you love me. We're bound together. Call insight, your intimate friend, insight. I need insight in my life. Insight is my intimate friends. Okay, God has put people in your lives to speak insight into your life. Call those people friend, but call the insight your friend. Let them speak into your life when they think that you're on the slippery slope. Call insight your intimate friend, not your enemy who's trying to pick on you. That's not what insight does. Insight is your intimate friend. Call wisdom your sister. Call insight your intimate friend so that to keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. 
Skipping down to verse 21, with much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her. See the desires of his heart. He's not believing the truth. He hasn't been binding the promises to his heart. And so now all of a sudden, his heart is getting hardened. He's having an unbelieving heart. Now he's following away. He's steering the ship towards this woman because she sounds good, she looks good, she's compelling. All at once he follows her, he follows her. No one forced him, he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver. So just like a helpless animal going to be slaughtered is this man going after this woman as a bird rushes into a snare, into a trap. He doesn't know that it's gonna cost him his life. And now, O oh sons, listen to me. And be attentive to the words in my mouth. The Lord says, now, listen, sons and daughters. Listen to my words, because this is real. Listen. Don't let your heart turn aside to her ways. Don't stray into her paths. For many a victim has she laid low. And all of her slain are a mighty throng. There's, there's so many, many, many mighty men and women have been caught up in. And that's why I say, guys, do not think that you're above this. Many a mighty man has been caught up in this. Many. Godly men and women have been caught up in this. Her house is the way to hell. Going down to the chambers of death. So how do we... How do we fight this, church? How do we fight this? Looking back at Hebrews 13, he says we need to exhort one another every day as long as it's called today so that none of us would be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Remember in the context of Matthew, we just got out of the conversation with Jesus where he speaks specifically of helping each other to be disciplined within a church context, called out on sin, cutting off the hand, plucking out the eye. We help each other do this. When one sheep goes astray, we go and we find that sheep and we bring that sheep back. And I, I, just, I, I need to just remind you guys, church family, couples, married couples, none of us, we're, we're not alone in this, okay? Marriage is out there. Right? You're struggling through some things. You, you're, you're getting in these quarrels. You're embarrassed to say something. You're embarrassed to ask for prayer in your community group or say things. You are not alone in this church. You're not alone. What you're going through is not rare. It's not unique. There's probably the couple that's sitting next to you is going through the same exact thing, but both you guys are embarrassed to say anything. You're ashamed or all these things. Don't be ashamed. Stop hiding in that place. You don't got this. You don't. All right? We, we, need, to, we need to get to this point where we say, I, I don't know what they're going to say, but I, we need to reach out to someone here before our hearts get hardened more and more and more and more, and we find ourselves going down that path to hell and destruction and death. Right, we, we've got to realize and believe deeply that you are not alone. Your situation is not unique. It's not. It is not. There should not be anything in your marriage that is off limits to talk to another couple about or a pastor or a counselor or whatever. Nothing should be off limits. We are broken people, church. We don't have time for pride here. We don't have time for preserving some false image or facade of some awesome uh, family life or awesome marriage. Nothing should be off limits. I'm not saying go tell everyone and go Facebook it and all that stuff. I'm talking about reaching out to someone else you can trust and saying, I got some embarrassing stuff that I need to talk about. And don't be embarrassed. I know that's easier said than done. But just step out. Just step out. Men, don't be prideful. Women, don't feel like failures. Just step out. I want to close just by reminding us of this here. Because as you, you look at your marriage specifically, but your friendships and, and our, our relationships, our marriages, are, they're, they're riddled with, with so many things, so many sins. I, I, know that, I know there's so much sin that's within your marriages, there's apathy, there's poor communication, there's stubbornness and pride, there's lust and pornography, there's insecurity, there's resentment and laziness, there's overworking. 
You just, you name it, you get on the list. I might have named all of them. So, I mean, you're like, yeah, all of those, Jovi, not just one or two, all of those. And that's, that's, that's actually pretty much par for the course. But I want to remind you of this, that, that as we, we, we think through that reality and we get so shame-filled and self-condemned, I, I just, you got to ask yourself, how many times in your life have you lied or cheated or stolen or looked at pornography or lusted in your heart or gone after other gods? How many times have you uh, been having anger towards someone, even your spouse? How many times have you belittled someone or gossiped about someone? How many times have you been passive-aggressive and manipulated your way into or out of a situation or circumstance? How many times have you sinned against your own spouse? How many times have you sinned against your own family, your kids, your friends, the people in your community groups, all these places? And all those times when Jesus Christ looks to you, he looks to you and says, I've forgotten all of it. It's, it's gone. You're, you're forgiven. I, I, don't, I don't see it. I've, I've, I've taken all that stuff and I've cast it into the sea as far as the east is from the west. That's how far I've forgotten those things. You're purified. You've been justified. I'm sanctifying you and you're gonna be glorified on the day of my return. And so as we look at all the embarrassing and shameful things in our marriages, we go, but God, you've said it's finished. God, you've reminded me that I've been purified and I've been I've been adopted as your son, as your daughter, and you've made me one with this, this woman or this man, and, and, and God, now as one, we come to you just as sinful, broken people, marred by sin, but covered in your blood. And so we have nothing to be shame-filled about. We can come out into the light with friends, family that love us. We can get prayer, and we can start the long road of, of recovery from the, 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 the war-torn hearts that we have but it's got to start with believing in your identity in Christ. That it does not matter what has ravaged through your marriage or your friendships, the blood of Jesus covers every last bit of it. I want to pray and ask the Lord to comfort us this morning and convict us this morning and we're going to actually have the time uh, a little bit different than normal today because I know that uh, this is, a lot of the stuff I know it just hits home uh, for probably most of us. So I want to pray that the Lord would just prepare our hearts for a, a time of just really going to him this morning and saying, God, we, we, need, we need your ministry today. We need the ministry of the Holy Spirit to work deeply in our hearts. Heavenly Father, we approach you now boldly and yet humbly. You are the Father of lights and every good and perfect gift comes from you and we're asking you this morning for a gift. We're asking you for a gift which is having our eyes open to the hardness of our hearts. God, the places where our desires, we give the steering wheel over to our desires and not to the Holy Spirit, not to the truth of the word of God. And God, we wanna acknowledge, even if we can't see what it is right now, we wanna acknowledge that there are probably areas in our life where we're on the slippery slope and we have blind spots and we don't see them right now and we're praying, Father, that your spirit would even show us right now. And maybe if there's been conversations in the past that loving friends have come to us and Maybe, maybe those old conversations might come up to mind right now and we actually recognize that in love they were correct. Holy Spirit, we, we pray that you would bring uh, the kind of conviction to our heart that doesn't lead to condemnation, but the conviction that leads to life. That as we see the, the, the passions that are just gaining momentum in our hearts, God, we would see that and we would not condemn ourselves, but we would run now to the freedom that we have in Christ. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us this morning to find the freedom that we need. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.